president is going to address the nation and presumably announce his resignation in a half an hour from now. People will be at television sets and radios tonight to hear what the president has to say. This is the political crime story of the century. In just a moment now, the president of the United States will begin uh, his speech, perhaps his last speech from the White House. He always saw enemies. He always saw people in the shadows. And his motto, I believe, was do unto others before they have a chance to do unto you. That's enough. There was an obsession with leaks. You don't blame the leaks when facts come out that are showing wrongdoing. Let me see that you get these lights properly out. Yes, he was not comfortable in front of a camera. One might even say that it was because he was afraid that the camera could see something he didn't want the American people to see. No, there, no, there will be no picture. This is the funny thing. Had it not been for Watergate, I think this man could have, could have gone down in history as one of the more significant presidents in the history of this country. We have 40 seconds to go now. Out. You don't have to stay, do you? We were witnessing the implosion of an American presidency. The president has taken his uh, place at the table in the White House where he's going to speak. Here now, the next picture will be the president of the United States. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. It was total tragedy, uh, total disgrace. Here was a man who uh, had fought all of his life to become the president of the United States. And he totally destroyed it. If someone looked in the soul of Richard Nixon, he knew, absolutely, that he was guilty. And that was the tragedy of Watergate. I don't come from a political family. I didn't think about the possibility of being president of the United States. My mother didn't take me into her arms and tell me someday you'll be president. Nixon is born in a dirt poor family. He applies to Ivy League colleges. He can't get into any of them. He makes the round of all the white shoe law firms in New York. He can't get hired. Richard Nixon was a fighter. There was a fire in this man. The people are sick and tired of it. They're outraged and they want something done about it and they're tired of an administration which instead of cleaning up is covering up the scandals in Washington at the present time. He goes from Navy to the House to the Senate to Vice President of the United States in six years. That's a meteoric rise. He wanted to prove something and he felt that political victory, political success would be the way to prove that he was who he thought he was. And I say we can't afford to have the White House as a training ground for an inexperienced man who is rash and impulsive. He is beaten by the telegenic, charismatic John F. Kennedy in 1960. Nixon looks at Kennedy, and Kennedy's everything he wants to be. Charming, cultured, charismatic, confident. That resentment is what drives Nixon. It drives him to try again. It drives him every time he gets knocked down and he's defeated. It drives him to stage the greatest comeback in American political history. I, Richard Billhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The American people oppose the continuation of this war. Everything was on fire in, in, in America. You had the Vietnam War that had been raging. Americans had also been through a traumatic decade. Three high-profile, shocking political assassinations. Get that gun! There was just an eruption of, of fury around the country. Nixon was defined by the Vietnam War. 
you had all sorts of music and movies and television all aimed at Nixon as being kind of the villain of his era. This is Richard. How I love to be President Nixon. <laughs> And Nixon just always seemed completely out of touch when it came to popular culture. I hope they sock it to you. I hope they sock it to me. Sock it to me? <laughs> He had the Ray Khan of singers to the White House. And if the music is square, it's because I like it square. Nixon offered a fairly simple view of the country. President Nixon, stop bombing human beings, animals, and vegetation. You go to church on Sundays and pray to Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ were here tonight, you would not dare drop another bomb. The counterculture saw Nixon as the example of everything they despised about government. It's a lot like today. You had a divided country, uh, my country right or wrong, uh, against the your country's always wrong. The terrorists of the far left would like nothing better than to make the president of the United States a prisoner in the White House. Well, let me just set them straight. As long as I am president, no band of violent thugs is going to keep me from going out and speaking with the American people whenever they want to hear me and whenever I want to go. Nixon saw the world in black and white, okay? You were either pro-Nixon or you were anti-Nixon. If you were anti-Nixon, he was going to get you. Oh, never forget. The press is the enemy. The press is the enemy. The press is the enemy. Write that in the black for 100 times and never forget. All presidents have a kind of tension, a conflict, and I would go so far as to say even hate members of the press. But I think what Nixon had trouble doing was sort of maintaining composure about those feelings. Don't get the impression that you arouse my anger. <laughs> you see, I have that impression. <laughs> you see, one can only be angry with those he respects. Richard Nixon hated the press. On June 13th, the New York Times began publishing a partial text of a secretly prepared study in the Pentagon relating to the origins of American involvement in Vietnam. In 1971, when Daniel Ellsberg leaks the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times, President Nixon was convinced that Ellsberg is part of a conspiracy of Democrats, and he's enraged and he's out of control. What made it especially problematic for Nixon was the first publication of the Pentagon Papers and shared the front page with the coverage of his own daughter's White House wedding. For a conspiracy theorist like Richard Nixon, the publishing of the Pentagon Papers the day after his daughter's wedding was not an accident. He wanted lie detector tests given to everybody. He wanted the name of the guy who was responsible. He wanted telephone taps. A lot of hyperbole, a lot of hubris in the, in the Oval Office. And it's in that environment that the White House creates the plumbers. They call us the plumbers because we are there to stop the leaks at the White House. Richard Nixon ordered the creation of the plumbers because he was convinced that the Ellsberg Pentagon Papers leak was just the beginning. During that period, they sent operatives secretly to look at Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. They thought that, that the conversations that Ellsberg had had with his psychiatrist might be a source of great stuff to destroy his public reputation. The way we would have met that challenge back when I was in the FBI while well, we would have pulled what is called a black bag job, a surreptitious entry, a covert operation. What we were engaged upon was something that had the full and hearty support of the executive branch of the United States government. You can do no wrong. There was an E for Ehrlichman by approve and underneath that he had written in his own handwriting if done under your assurance that it will not be traceable. And that was our written authority to go out and conduct that covert operation. These underlings, they are responding to the boss's needs and desires, and they want to make him happy. And so they push very hard. And he doesn't ask them for the details of how they do things. He doesn't care about the details. But he's created an immoral climate where almost anything goes. 
He is ultimately responsible for the climate in which these zealots operated. We're up against an enemy, a conspiracy, they're using any means. We are going to use any means. Is that clear? Get it done. I want it done. People of that era taped. They taped their phone calls. And Nixon would have known that presidents prior to him, also from that generation, taped. So Nixon continued the practice, but he also greatly expanded it by making it sound activated. February 1971 is when the taping system goes in. In the first couple of days of taping, there's a little discussion about the whole system. Taping was done for the purpose of having it for the historical record. It was voice activated. Everything was taped, which of course was probably stupid. There is a lack of confidence in the conduct of the war and so forth. If we start, you know, simpering around and catering to these bastards, hell, they would just eat us alive. We must keep up the tech in the media. You've got to keep destroying their credibility. There's not a good one on the whole M3 network, no, not one. Without the tapes, Richard Nixon, I think, would have survived. When the tapes were revealed, one or two of them proved from his own lips, from his own words, that he had orchestrated the cover-up of Watergate. Next. I said, I am to kill Jack Anderson. I am on my way to kill Jack Anderson. Seventy-two was a very busy year for me. Uh, it was a year when we had the visit to China. It was a year when we had the visit to Moscow. And then in December, of course, perhaps the most difficult decision I made of the December bombing, which did lead to the uneasy peace, but it is peace with all the Americans home, all of our POWs home. Now, during that period of time, frankly, I didn't manage the campaign. I didn't run the campaign. People around me didn't bring things to me that they probably should have, because I was, frankly, just too busy trying to do the nation's business to run the politics. If mistakes are made, however, I'm not blaming the people down below. The man at the top's got to take the heat for all of them. Nixon had very loyal men around him, folks who were willing to walk over broken glass uh, and he exploits that. Nixon exploits that, and he gets them to do his bidding. Nixon had a tendency to surround himself with these young Southern California ad agency types. The White House staff, as it evolves, I think you'll find will be smaller than it's been in the past. I know you'll find it'll be probably the youngest one in history, certainly one of the youngest. Richard Nixon managed to charm them, and that charm was so strong that he pulled them over the line. He encouraged them to do things that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise done. And they seemed to be involved in one giant contest to prove to the boss who could be tougher, who could be more ruthless. And critics call them the Germans and describe their office as the Berlin Wall. I'm speaking of President Nixon's chief White House advisors, John Ehrlichman, and HR for Harry Robbins Haldeman. Haldeman and Ehrlichman were, were like brothers to Nixon at times. I mean, they served in every possible personal and professional role for him. Haldeman and Ehrlichman understood the importance of protecting the president. I knew Haldeman to say hello to, although he was a much feared figure. And I remember my father used to call him the jolly steel buzzsaw. You want to understand Bob Haldeman? Look at his haircut. Bob Haldeman was the chief of staff of the White House. And people said, whatever Haldeman knows, the president knows. In February of 1972, the election year, there was one reputable poll that said that uh, one of his opponents within one point of beating him in an election. And clearly, Mr. Nixon said, I'm going to make certain that my enemies don't get me. The Nixon campaign's political propaganda arm publicly portrays two arch villains to the re-elect Nixon effort. The national media, which will slant stories unfavorable to the administration, and Democratic frontrunner George McGovern. Operation Gemstone was a plan of dirty tricks, 
and of political tactics leading up to the election year of 1972. Nixon would call it rock'em sock'em politics or hardball. It wasn't just tough politics. It was criminal behavior. I said, well, if you're talking about an all-out, full offensive and defensive capability political intelligence uh, operation, you're talking about one hell of a lot of money. G. Gordon Liddy put together this, this madcap collection of crimes. Each different kind of operation was given the name of a precious jewel. We had so many operations, we quickly ran out of precious jewels. We went into semi-precious jewels, and by the time we were finished, we were down to coal and brick. Liddy, I say, was a cowboy. Liddy was a hotshot. Liddy, Liddy was the guy who would do it and could do it. When you hire a G. Gordon Liddy, you're hiring a guy that's going to do what he's told to do, and there's not a lot of boundaries. We later learned that Howard Hunt and Gordon Liddy plotted to try to kill Jack Anderson, the columnist. Gordon Liddy brushed by me and he said, Jeb just told me to take care of Jack Anderson. I said, I am to kill Jack Anderson. I am on my way to kill Jack Anderson. He said, oh my God. He took off like a deer running down the hall. I then went into Magruder's office and I said, Jeb, uh, did you just tell him to rub out Jack Anderson? I said, uh, to Gordon, I was just uh, talking off the cuff. I wasn't serious. And Liddy looked at me with that stern, you know, sort of macho look and he said, Never give me an order for a hit job that you don't mean, because I'll do it. The irony is that he had been an FBI officer. And yet, he comes out of the FBI environment, and he is ready to break laws at the request of the executive. Gordon Liddy goes to the Department of Justice, the highest law enforcement officer in the land. He's in the Attorney General's very formal office, and Gordon Liddy presents Operation Gemstone, under which they will not only break into the DNC offices in the Watergate complex, but they will hire a houseboat to place outside of the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami during the Democratic Convention. They will put prostitutes on this houseboat with cameras so that they will lure Democratic delegates onto the houseboat and blackmail them. John Mitchell, who was transitioning from the Department of Justice to the head of the Committee to Reelect the President, was the man who was going to okay or not this collection of crimes. They asked for a million dollars, and John Mitchell didn't say, are you guys crazy? Get out of here. That's all illegal. That's crazy. No, he said, it's too expensive. Please come back with a lower budget. There was pressure from the White House, from me, and from the President, to the committee to get their campaign intelligence activity going. To me, it was a throwaway project. You know, give Liddy the quarter million dollars and let's get him off our back and, and satisfy the White House. And Mitchell finally said, okay, let's, let's go with it. I remember at the beginning, there was a sense of the mastermind of all of this is Gordon Liddy. Well, history now has established that the mastermind was Richard Nixon. And so when we come to the Watergate story, it was perfectly in character, even though he looked like he was set up for a pretty comfortable re-election campaign, it was perfectly in character for him to say, well, I want every advantage. I will approve this, I will approve that, because he thought if he played it straight, he might lose. And so he played it a little crooked. I was called in by Jeb Stuart Magruder to his office, and he said, can you get into the Watergate office building? Over the weekend, five men were nabbed in the Democratic National Headquarters here in Washington, seemingly preparing to tap our bug. Continue with more of Truth and Lies, Watergate. There were a lot of street muggings, a lot of armed robberies. I was a sergeant assigned to the people on the street, called us the bum squad. What I looked like in 1972 was like a junior Charles Manson. Georgetown, Friday night going into Saturday is always crazy back then. On June 17, 1972, there was a break-in at the Democratic National Committee's headquarters in the Watergate office complex. This was the start of what would be the political crime of the century. I was called in by Jeb Stuart Magruder to his office, and he said, can you get into the Watergate office building? 
We want you to put in a room monitoring device. I took a dangerous gamble and risk. I recruited Mr. James McCord, who was the security chief of the committee to re-elect the president. And the plan was to get negative information about the potential nominee of the Democratic Party, but how are you going to get the negative information? A lot of people would say breaking into the Democratic National Committee was way out off the charts. Yes, but not that far off. The entry night was uh, to be uh, Friday night to June 16th. There was a man working in the back very, very late. I mean, he stayed and he stayed and he stayed. It's a Friday night. I mean, this was some dedicated Democrat. We thought he'd never go home. McCord would go into the Watergate building and put in tapes in the door. It was taped, so it would, would not lock. The hero of that night was a man named Frank Wills. Frank Wills was the security guard at the Watergate office building. That was just a guard, and I was doing my duty. You found the door taped once, and, and you took the tape off. And then you found it taped the second time. It was something that told me that you should check not only check the door, but they should call the police. About 1.52 in the morning, the call comes out for an alleged burglary at the Watergate Hotel. I just kind of blinked my eyes, yeah, we'll take the call. We were there in a minute, minute and a half. We approached the uh, front door, 2600 Virginia Avenue. We saw the guard in there, Frank Wills, sitting here at the guard post and uh, walked up to this door here, the front door, and I, I took out my badge to make sure he could see us and knew who we were, and I, I tapped it on the glass like this. I said, police. I had on an a old funky golf cap. I think I had just a, like a T-shirt underneath, trying to give me the image I wasn't a police officer. If a uniform car had answered that call, it could have been a whole different ball game. There's a lookout. Alfred Baldwin was supposed to warn the burglars if there's trouble. The police unit that responds to the call, they're not dressed like police officers. So Baldwin doesn't even notice them. You've got a, a door down there taped. We found the eighth floor taped. We found the sixth floor taped. Uh, our adrenaline is, is pumped. OK, this was the uh, hallway door. We came into the district of Democratic National Committee. We get to this room here. I kicked the door open. I pulled my revolver. The desk was all ransacked and disheveled and messed up. And as it turns out, probably every room in the DNC was like this. And we found out later that they were always messed up. We were in contact by transceiver with our men inside the Watergate and also with the lookout, Mr. Baldwin, across the street. He was watching a show uh, called Attack of the Puppet People. And he was glued to the TV set. So by the time he, they broke in and he looked back out, he saw lights coming on on the DNC. The actual uh, reception room lights up, which I can see directly across from where I'm standing. And I know three individuals come into the reception area. By the time Alfred Baldwin had notified them it was too late, and they had to run and hide like rats. We're rolling down this hallway, checking the offices on both sides of the hallways, looking in here, joining and turning the lights on, make sure that nobody's hiding from behind us. What's running through my mind is, if there's anybody here, they're here. I was startled by an arm hitting next to the glass on the petition. It scared the living bejesus out of me. I um. I screamed something to the effect, come out with your hands up or I'm going to blow your head off. And in a very soft whisper, I heard a voice, they've got us. Ten hands went up, and they came out, and that's where the arrest occurred, right here. And they see these three guys that don't look anything like police officers with pointing guns at them. They were wired. They were hyper. They, they just, it didn't all add up. I don't think I've ever locked up a, another burglar who was dressed in a suit and tie and was in middle age. It didn't compute with them what was going on and who they had, except they knew we didn't belong there. Well, McCord said to me twice, he said, are you the police? And I thought, why is he asking such a silly question? Of course we're the police. The five burglars that were arrested inside the DNC were McCord, Barker, 
Sturgis, Martinez, and Gonzalez. This was not your normal, typical burglary. There was bugging devices, tear gas pens, many, many rolls of film, locksmith tools, thousands of dollars and hundred dollar bills consecutively ordered. Who goes into the Democratic National Committee looking for money or looking for jewels or looking for something that an ordinary burglar would? No, you go to looking for political information. And who wants that? Why, your opponent, naturally. Coming up next. Listen, I'm tired of your chicken games. I need to know what you know. Get out your notebook. The Democratic National Committee is trying to solve a spy mystery. Five men were nabbed in the Democratic National Headquarters here in Washington, seemingly preparing to tap or bug the place. People weren't saying, oh my God, this is clearly going to implicate Richard Nixon. It just seemed bizarre. It would take some enterprising young journalists to ferret out the importance of the story. Woodward and Bernstein were assigned to this burglary just as a matter of routine. Editors kind of said, we've got this strange burglary. And I saw this commotion around the city desk and was told that there had been this break-in at Democratic National Headquarters. They were young reporters trying to make their way up the ladder in the Washington Post. When you talk about the people who made a difference when it came to Watergate, you talk about Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. They were two very different people. Woodward came from the Navy. He was a straight-laced guy. Bernstein, on the other hand, looked like a counterculture figure himself. I was supposedly the terrific writer. He was supposedly the great persistent reporter. Their skills complemented each other. They sent me to the courthouse where the five burglars caught in the Democratic headquarters were being arraigned. The judge asked the leader, James McCord, where did you work? And McCord went, CIA. It was stunning. And they discovered that McCord was a security chief for the committee to re-elect the president. Well, okay, folks, this was a political break-in. There was a notebook belonging to one of the burglars that had the name in it H. Hunt W. House. We figured that uh, W. House, it either had to be the White House or the Whore House. The question was, who was H. Hunt? I called the White House and eventually got Hunt on the phone and just asked, why was your name in the address books of two of these burglars? And he screamed out, good God, slammed down the phone and left town. And of course, it turned out to be Howard Hunt, who had worked for the CIA, who had been hired at the White House, really, to undertake dirty tricks. You knew that this smoke that was billowing up from the Oval Office, there had to be some fire there. It's like the Dylan song, it don't take a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Presidential press secretary Ron Ziegler called it a third-rate burglary attempt and said it was nothing the president would ever be concerned with. Richard Nixon is obstructing justice from the beginning. But what would be known as the smoking gun was when he approves a plan to use the CIA to blunt an FBI investigation into the money that the burglars had. It's clear in the conversation that this is being done for political purposes, basically to save the skin of the White House. And the president says he approves it. Woodward and Bernstein had scores of sources, but there was one source that was special, a guy really high up. He was known as Deep Throat. My father was like a superhero because he was a G-man. He carried a gun. He was handsome as heck. He wanted the American people to know the truth. We would learn years later that Deep Throat was Mark Felt, number two at the FBI. He was in the perfect position to understand what was coming into the investigation, as well as what he could observe maybe from above the investigation. I want to talk about Watergate. And yeah, I'd like to talk about that subject. All the president's men created a sense of danger. They were constantly risking things by trying to find out the truth. You can trust me, you know that. Deep Throat was very insistent that we have a communication system that no one else could understand. Now, if you watch the movie, if uh, Woodward put the flower pot on his balcony in a certain way, that was a signal to the source that wanted to meet. He moves the flower pot to talk to the source. I kind of looked at him cockeyed at first, but it was evident why. The other thing the movie did was create that expression, follow the money. Just follow the money. And put it into American culture. Deep Throat 
made it clear that the money was important, that there was a trail to follow. And Carl established that a $25,000 check had actually gone into the bank account of one of the Watergate burglars. The $25,000 check linked contributions to President Nixon's re-election campaign to the slush fund used to pay the burglars who broke into the Watergate office complex. I, I said, oh my God, this now establishes a, an undeniable connection between the committee for Nixon's re-election and the burglars. What became crucial was to get hold of a list of the employees. We would go to people's homes at night and knock on doors. Hi, I'm Carl Bernstein. Carl Bernstein found the bookkeeper. In the movie, All the President's Men, I think they uh, reflected my feelings pretty well. It's for you. It's Carl Bernstein. When he first came to my door... Can I just borrow one of your cigarettes there? I was pretty nervous, didn't want him to be there. Could I just sit down for a second? I don't exactly know why I didn't throw Carl out. You can sit down, but I'm not going to tell you anything. Even though I was hesitant. I wanted him to know. She knew a lot about the finances of the campaign, but more than that, she knew about this secret fund. She was suspicious because there were all of these large amounts of money going to people. Was it all $100 bills? A lot of it was. And it was supposed to be secret. I'm sure we counted in over two or three million dollars. The great majority of that was cash. There were people who were authorized to distribute money from the secret fund, and one of them was Mitchell. John Mitchell was the attorney general. He was a Nixon loyalist. The highest law enforcement officer in America control the secret fund that paid for undercover activities against Nixon's political opponents. Bradley said they're about to call the Attorney General of the United States a crook. There's never been a story like this in our history. And uh, we took a deep breath and said, yeah. And uh, I said, Mr. Mitchell, we have a story in the Morris paper I'd, I'd like to read to you. And uh, he said, go right ahead. I got as far as John N. Mitchell while Attorney General of the United States control the secret fund. And Mitchell said, Jesus Christ, all that crap, you're putting that in the paper. If you print that, Katie Graham, referring to Catherine Graham, the publisher of the Washington Post, is going to get her tit caught in a big fat ringer. It was so vulgar and so shocking and also so threatening. They were going to get her. They were going to get the Post. And then he said, and when this campaign is over, we're going to do a little story on you two boys, too. And he hung up the phone. And I have to tell you, it's the most chilling moment I've ever had being a reporter, because he meant it. And ABC News has projected that Richard Nixon has in fact been re-elected to the presidency to a second term. So the question now, I suppose, is uh, how big will Mr. Nixon win? It was a giant landslide. There was virtually no reaction to the stories we did. And it was a way of saying, Watergate? Who cares? And whatever happened to Watergate? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Apparently nothing. <laughs> They've got a trial of the, of the uh, accused in that case, and that's uh, going to be tried in due course, and I think that's probably the end of the story. Lies. Watergate. Mr. President, are you ready to take the Constitution oath? The Supreme Court ruled that abortion is completely a private matter. Vietnam cost 55,000 American lives. Today, the United States ends its role in the conflict. We finally have achieved a peace with honor. I know it gags some of you to write that phrase, but that is true. So in January 1973, you know, Nixon's kind of, he's at the peak, the peak of the mountain. Place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. He has a second inauguration. I, Richard Nixon, do solemnly swear. Richard Nixon won re-election, not just handily, but very, very bigly, if I may use that word. We stand on the threshold of a new era of peace in the world. Mr. President, as we've seen on this parade route, waving at the crowd with that familiar double V. 55 floats, some 35 bands. There was a cool confidence uh, at the committee to reelect the president that this would blow over. But still, I think the storm clouds are starting to gather. For six months, 
the cover-up was working. And so if you were investigating the story, people looked at you as if you were a bit of a conspiracy theorist. I mean, why, why are you bothering with that? By Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, they're still pressing. Uh, they're, they're digging deeper, they're digging harder. And so Nixon still has this residual fear that somehow it might not stop. And it caused a firestorm within the White House because they said, oh my God, somebody's getting close. I want it clearly understood that from now on, ever, no reporter from the Washington Post is ever to be in the White House. Is that clear? Absolutely. Yes, yes sir. None ever to be in. Now that is a total order, and, the, and if, if necessary, I'll fire you. I don't respect the type of journalism the shabby journalism that is being practiced by the Washington Post. This is Bob Woodward of the Washington Post. I'm the sorry. thing that's so powerful, both in real life and in the movie All the Presidents Met, is that people will do anything to conceal their involvement. People at the highest levels are much more involved than Woodward and Bernstein recognize. Listen, I'm tired of your chicken games. I don't want hints. I need to know what you know. It's incredible cover-up had little to do with Watergate. It was mainly to protect the covert operations. Get out your notebook. There's more. The last meeting with Deep Throat, a lot was revealed. He kept saying the Watergate burglary is not just one isolated operation. This is a much bigger story than you think. Here was an inside mole who was reporting to the newspapers and so forth and giving them all the scoop. Uh, that made it appear all very credible. Uh, while they stuck the knife in and twisted it pretty good, we gave the knife to them. Woodward and Bernstein were very important. They deserve all the accolades. They elevate the story so that the Senate and others can take notice of it at a time when the cover-up was working. Three, take one. The Senate tonight voted 77 to nothing to establish a select committee to investigate alleged political espionage in last year's election campaign. That includes the Watergate bugging case. We will cooperate fully with the Senate, just as we did with the FBI previously in the, what was called the Watergate matter. One of the president's first questions is, uh, what, what is all this off on the horizon, no larger than a man's hand? What is this committee? The committee will be headed by North Carolina Democrat Sam Irvin. If it wasn't the press, the Congress wouldn't have done anything about it. The story would have been covered up. Nobody would have ever heard about it. The White House strategy is to contain the damage, to keep the legal responsibility held to seven people, the five burglars and E. Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy. The usual thing in a situation like this in the intelligence service is that they will have bail provided for them, they will have counsel, legal counsel provided for them. They promised they would pay them and take care of their families if they just went to jail and didn't reveal the involvement of the White House. So they were basically ready to plead guilty and keep quiet. Howard Hunt, a former White House consultant, pleads guilty to all charges in the Watergate bugging trial. Mr. Hunt, if you could just come up to the microphone. Let me know what all cameras are rolling. Mr. Hunt, is there anyone higher up involved in the conspiracy? I would testify as follows, gentlemen, that to my personal knowledge, there was not. And they take the rap. They essentially cop to it hoping that the buck will stop there. One of the problems of sort of paying hush money is that no price is too big. And Howard Hunt it needed more and needed more and needed more. All of us were headed for prison, and that something ought to be done, should be done. And if they didn't, then dire consequences for the administration could result. Just a plain statement of fact, not a threat. John Dean says, it's become like a mafia. Where does it end? We are being blackmailed by our own people. The cover-up was collapsing, but Dean realized it was about to come apart. Next. He had enough explosive information that he would blow the White House. It was the O.J. Simpson trial of its era, almost like some kind of mafia story. On June 17, 1972, there was a break-in in the Watergate office complex. Three, take one. Five men were nabbed in the Democratic National Headquarters here in Washington. Is there anyone higher up involved in the conspiracy? What did the president know, and when did the president know it? The pressure was building today on President Nixon. He sort of lost control, a dangerous uh, trait in a president. You must keep up the tag on the media. You've got to keep destroying their credibility. 
Nixon was orchestrating the cover-up. I want this. I want that. I'm the president. Get it. Now, from our studios in Washington, a special report. The Senate sprung into action. It started holding hearings. It had love, hate, greed, you name it. The greatest show on the earth. I hear a gavel pounding. If you swear that the evidence shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I knew it was going to be my word against his word. The scandal has now moved right to the doorway of the Oval Office in the White House. The American people are outraged. This guy's jumping all over me about what it gains. No one is above the law. People have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Are you sorry you didn't burn the tapes? The answer is... Impeach Nixon now! Impeach Nixon now! Impeach Nixon now! These are days of virtual paralysis within the top echelon of the White House staff because of nervousness, suspicion, and uncertainty generated by the Watergate scandal. No one was killed at Watergate. Uh, no one profited from Watergate the way we handled it. Took what was basically a misdemeanor and made it the crime of the century. There was an instability at the center of the Nixon White House, and it was Nixon himself. When an emotionally unstable person gets power and then feels that they're invincible, they can do whatever they want to do because they have that power, that's a dangerous course of action. Richard Nixon was looking for loyalty, blind loyalty. He was a man who, who didn't trust many people. John Dean, his White House counsel, although not a loyalist, was willing to do what Richard Nixon wanted. John was only 32. Dean fascinated all of us because he had tassels on his loafers and his hair was a little curled up a little bit. We thought that was pretty cool. And he was a cool guy and a smart guy. The FBI has established that high Republican officials ordered a campaign of spying and sabotage against the Democrats. After the Watergate break-in, Dean was put in charge by the president of the cover-up. He was a lawyer. He knew that he had engaged in criminal activity. Any further developments in Watergate, John Dean is watching it on an almost full-time basis and reporting to her on a continuous basis on our and no one else. One of the lawyers from the re-election committee came over to my office and said, Hunt has a message for you that if he doesn't get $120,000, he's gonna have some seamy things to say about what he did for John Ehrlichman. He let it be known that he had enough explosive information and evidence on Richard Nixon that he would blow the White House out of the ground. Dean was unable to control this anymore and had to fully report to Nixon for the first time on something's gonna give. We need a change in strategy. John Dean realized that that the cover-up was was coming apart. Hunt now is demanding another seventy-two thousand dollars for his own personal expenses, another fifty thousand dollars to pay his attorney's fees, one hundred twenty-some thousand dollars. Once he wanted to buy the close of business yesterday, I decided I had to give him everything I could give him to get him to end the cover-up, to just go in and blow it away. Uh, but there's no denying the fact that the White House and uh, Ehrlichman, Holland, and Dean are involved in some of the early money decisions. He asked me how much could it cost, and I pulled out of thin air what I thought was the number that he'd find offensive. I would say these people are going to cost a million dollars over the next few years. It doesn't bother him at all. You can get a million dollars, and you can get it in cash. I, I know where it can be gotten. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not easy, but it could be done. It wasn't just tough politics. It was criminal behavior. It was the kind of behavior that a later generation would associate with the Sopranos. That's the day I think I really first meet Richard Nixon. I met somebody who would do what was ever necessary to stay in power. With Dean, he's beginning to worry because he doesn't trust him anymore. He saw John Dean as, as disloyal. And Dean, I think, rightly suspected that he was going to be the fall guy. Trial proceedings open today in the celebrated Watergate bugging case. It was a cover-up, and it worked. Until it didn't. <laughs> and Judge Sirico was one of the reasons it didn't. The Honorable Chief Judge John J. Sirica presiding. John J. Sirica was not a dumb-dumb. 
He saw, he read the papers, he knew something really bad was going on here. Far more is involved here than the guilt or innocence of the seven defendants. If they are guilty, why did they do it? And who put them up to it? The judge says the jury will want to know. He did not believe that there weren't higher-ups involved. He just had a good sniffer for corruption and for lying. These five burglars and the two other people involved as the masterminds came before him in court. He threatened them through their lawyers. If they don't come clean, said John J. Sirica, I'm going to throw the book at them, and I can give them sentences of 40 years. Sirica, having a very good idea that somebody might crack, and um, they did. James McCord wrote a letter to the judge. In it, he charged that perjury was committed during the trial. McCord, uh, in his letter to Judge Sirica, he said, this thing is getting closer to the top than you think about. People lied on the stand, and you need to know this. I think we all in the courtroom kind of were gasped. Higher-ups were responsible. It acknowledged that there was a cover-up, so it was very significant. Today, the Watergate scandal became a whole new ball game. McCord implicated two Nixon aides in the break-in. I had no knowledge of the Watergate at all, and I don't think I ought to say anything further. Everybody began to realize that this wasn't just a third-rate burglary, as Ron Ziegler, President Nixon's press officer, said. And then you start hearing about bags of cash being delivered as hush money, and I think that's what really got to the American public. Americans have been hearing about Watergate since the scandal broke last June. But most have only recently begun paying attention. I'm up to here with Watergate. I'm drowning in Watergate. Oh, actually, the whole country's drowning in Watergate. The president actually, as you know, has asked us to turn down all thermostats. His critics claim he'll do anything to get the heat off. You know what they say, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, and the louder they laugh. And that's what Nixon learned. Watergate was not just a national tragedy. It was a personal tragedy. Things got worse and worse in the White House. <laughs> Can you describe now that atmosphere for us? It was really like being besieged because every day there was a new charge and rumor. My father was being buffeted by a whole windfall of charges, counter charges. Almost every day recently, the Watergate has produced its quota of sensation. I was just upset that he was so upset that he was closing us all off. When he came over for dinner, he would be just to eat and then to leave. And he didn't really want to have any discussions. He wanted to keep the family at arm's length from Watergate. The First Lady, Pat Nixon, you can see that Watergate took a toll on her. The way she would handle it was to just assure him of her trust and faith in him. And she felt if my father could remain strong and withstand the battle, that, that he could survive it. It became more tense, more tense, by the, by the day, by the hour, by the minute. There's no question about it. There was a sense that we were constantly under siege, especially from the national media. And people felt they were all under attack. At a certain point, they, they were all liable to be indicted. I was in trouble, and I knew it. We're on Air Force One, and I'm standing on the flight deck, and it occurred to me very, uh, for about 30 seconds, that I could crash this airplane, and that would put an end to everybody's problems. Mine, and Nixon's, and Haldeman's, and everybody, everybody who was aboard. The investigation was closer to Nixon than it, it had ever been before, and Nixon knew that some dramatic change was necessary. Look, if we went in and sackcloth and ashes and fired the whole White House staff, that's going to satisfy these They'd still be after. Who are they after? Hell, they are after all of them. They my Nixon thought that if I offer up, as he said, my right arm and my left arm at the same time, that that might be enough that, that the investigation stops there. I got a call from the president from Camp David, and the White House operator got me on the phone, and there was a long, long delay before finally the president came on in a very muffled, downbeat voice and said, I was wondering if you could get up here at 1.30 today. Bob Haldeman called me and said, uh, the president wants to see us. I said, what's up? He says he's decided to fire us. The president began to sob. And uh, I put my arm around his shoulder. As, uh, at that point, I was feeling more sorry for him than I, <laughs> I was for myself. Today, in one of the most difficult decisions of my presidency, 
I accepted the resignations of two of my closest associates in the White House, Bob Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, two of the finest public servants it has been my privilege to know. The counsel to the president, John Dean, has also resigned. Two of the finest public servants I've ever known, said Nixon, showing them the door, hoping to save himself, of course. The biggest White House scandal in a century, the Watergate scandal, broke wide open today. The White House is in a state of shock. It was one of the most painful things he had had to do in his political career. Hello. Hi. I hope I didn't let you down. No, sir. You got your points over, and now you now you're you got to cut right and move on. Well, it was a tough thing, Bob, for you, for John, the rest. But I'm never going to discuss this son of a bitching Watergate thing again. Never, 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 never. But let me say, you're a strong man. And I love you. <laughs> and I, you know, I love John. God bless you, boy. Okay. God bless you. I love you, you know. Okay. Like my brother. Nixon was a brilliant politician who, with an open blue sky over your head, could predict political storms before anyone else saw them. Yet in hindsight, we look at this and say, uh, where was this astute politician? Next. It seemed impossible. It seemed improbable. What did the president know, and when did he know it? And yet, it happened. Washington summer days are the most humid, hot days anywhere in the entire country, I think. And the hotter the weather got, the hotter Watergate got. Program ...to bring you a special report on the Senate Watergate hearings. This was the O.J. Simpson trial of its era. The word crisis is perhaps too mild to apply to Watergate. Everybody was in a, in a frenzy around D.C. A famous caucus room. Almost every day, there were lines of people waiting outside. Will you just tell us once again what you said about calling the president? I was the Watergate correspondent for ABC News. I hear a gavel pounding, so let's go inside. There were only three television networks in those days. There were no cable networks. There was no internet, of course. Every day, people were watching. Farmers, mechanics. And you were keeping up with the story because it had everything in it. It had love, hate, greed, you name it. The greatest show on the earth. Why didn't you throw Mr. Liddy out of your office? In hindsight, I not only should have thrown him out of the office, I should have thrown him out of the window. As it's developing, though, it's not immediately clear that you're in the funny farm of all times. My job was to raise an unbelievable amount of money. And Mr. Liddy said he would have a million dollars for his plan. Yes, sir. Well, since that's a rather handsome sum, did it pique your curiosity? About this wasn't some boring Senate hearing. This was about corruption and obstruction of justice. It's, a, it's an obscure question to me. No, it's a simple question. If the answer is no, say no. If the answer is yes, say yes. Would you, would you restate the question for me, please? Richard Nixon told Haldeman to lie to the Senate Select Committee. He said, just say you can't remember. And guess what? Haldeman said, gee, I can't remember. <laughs> I don't know that. I don't know anything about it. I don't know that I did, Mr. Chairman. You I never knew what would be said. Now, yes. You never knew who would be speaking. How do you know that, Mr. Chairman? Because I can understand the English language as my mother tongue. The chairman was Sam Urban, a southerner from North Carolina. I'm just a country lawyer from way down in North Carolina. He's an old country lawyer about like I'm an astronaut. Well, I don't believe there's anything in the Constitution that says uh, the powers of the presence should be separated from truth. When the details came out and people saw that this, that this was almost like some kind of mafia story. What was the altercation, if you could be a little more specific? Uh, well, I, I simply put my hand on Mr. Liddy's uh, shoulder and he asked me to remove it. Uh, was he more specific? Well, he indicated he would kill me, but... Uh, it's the country's favorite soap opera. It's confusing. McCord was a pretty good wire man. It's complicated. I would say he was one of the best wire men in the business. Some of the characters are unforgettable. Well, no retired man in the New York City Police Department was becoming involved in a thing like that. That's for sure. <laughs> It seemed impossible, it seemed improbable, and yet it happened. And the next logical man to hear from would appear to be John Dean. John Dean, White House lawyer, testifies about Nixon, and that changed everything about Watergate. People were, were riveted 
by this young man they'd never heard of before. I sincerely wish I could say it's my pleasure to be here today, but I think you can understand why it's not. Good-looking guy, very conservative, well-dressed. He had a beautiful wife. Maureen Dean with her blonde hair. She seemed very mysterious. I mean, she was sitting behind him, and she was looking perfect every day. And she never let on at all what her emotions were. My wife had initially typed my handwritten notes. Had they told me I was going to have to read it, I would have never done 60,000 words. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. He was reading this text about the president of the United States. And if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. And the details were surprising. I subsequently met with Mr. Ehrlichman. I remember well his instructions. He told me to shred the documents and deep six the briefcase. And the picture was disturbing. The money was laundered so it could not be traced. And then there were secret deliveries. A crime followed by another crime, followed by another crime, each more preposterous than the one before it. I then proceeded to tell him that perjury had been committed and for this cover-up to continue would require more perjury and more money. Until that point, the Nixon White House had successfully stonewalled investigations of the president's role in the cover-up. John Dean cut through that like a knife through butter. John Dean said the president is involved in the cover-up. The central question at this point is simply put, what did the president know, and when did he know it? And from that moment on, Watergate became Nixon versus Dean, who was telling the truth. I knew it was going to be my word against his word, and I knew he'd already called me uh, a liar. So I slipped a couple pages into my testimony that I thought that I had been recorded in one or more conversations. John Dean had mentioned tapes. That was the only time that listening devices, tapes, had even been mentioned to anyone. So I had every reason to believe that I would not be asked about tapes. When Alexander Butterfield acknowledged that these tapes existed, it was like a bombshell going off. There was a certain innocence about the presidency. And when he said, no, the president is taping his most secret, most confidential conversations, it was like, oh my god. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. What did the president know, and when did he know it? At that point, in June of 1973, it was John W. Dean, a little-known former counsel to the president, versus Richard Nixon, a man the country had known for 30 years, and now president of the United States. Whom? was the country going to believe, Dean or Nixon? The key witness in the minds of people who were there and later on was Alexander Butterfield. Subcommittee will come to order. Well, Alexander Butterfield was the president's personal assistant who would kind of keep the trains running on time, keep the flow of people and paper in and out of the Oval Office. He saw everything. Butterfield was called just to see if he had anything to say that was worthwhile, and uh, he did. I was told the president wants you to get a taping system, but the idea was it's not just going to be a little thing in a desk drawer, and he wants it on all the telephones, uh, office phones, and in the Oval Office. When I briefed the president, it was just the president and I. I took him through it. He was embarrassed the whole time. He didn't like me telling him about the stuff that he'd had put in. And I do believe he needed to know where the microphones were. And they were on the base of the lamps over the mantelpiece. And then I hated to tell him that they drilled these holes in his desk. He was embarrassed that I was telling him about this thing that he had asked that it be installed. He would like to have asked that uh, unbeknownst to anyone. Listen, this wasn't a happy day for me. I knew there was skullduggery going on in the White House. Uh, Mr. Butterfield, will you stand and raise your right hand? My name is Alexander Porter Butterfield. Red Thompson, 
who was uh, the counsel for the Republicans. Mr. Butterfield, I understand you previously were employed by the White House. Ask the question. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. I knew how huge that was. I also knew that he would have trouble surviving. And at that point, like all the other reporters in the room, I said to myself, the jig is up. If those tapes prove that Richard Nixon orchestrated a cover-up, let alone whether they proved that he'd ordered the break into the Watergate, he's cooked. But to a lot of the people I knew and my friends, they were probably saying, that son of a bitch, he is hurting our man. I understood Nixon. I honestly understood it all very well. I knew Nixon so damn well. So I hated to be the guy. Did you ever hear any of these tapes being played? Yes, sir, I did. So once Alexander Butterfield disclosed the existence of the taping system, the real challenge then for the Irvin Committee was finding a path to subpoena those tapes. The Senate recognized it had the power to ensure that there'd be a full and complete investigation and they exercised that power. The Attorney General Elliot Richardson appointed Archibald Cox, a Harvard professor, to be the special prosecutor. The guidelines or charter for the special prosecutor state that he will have full authority. The special prosecutor was given a mandate of independence to investigate Watergate no matter where it went. When the tapes were revealed, the pressure is on the president to produce those tapes or run the grave risk that public opinion will decide he can't because of what is on them. Cox asked the White House to give him the tapes, and Nixon refused. Nixon was raging like in the summer of 1973. He's so angry. He's angry because Archibald Cox is putting pressure. He wants the tapes. Well, whether we get them or not is now an issue for the courts. I think the, the powers of the presidency had never been challenged before the way they were when the special prosecutor subpoenaed Nixon's White House tapes. And he just can't stand what's going on. And he wants to, he wants to get rid of Archibald Cox, I mean, to fire him. And his people say, no, Mr. President, don't do that. That's going to cause more trouble. Worst thing you can do is to fire the head of an investigation. It makes you look guilty. And ultimately, the Court of Appeals ruled that the tapes had to be turned over. The president had lost any patience. He said, get rid of Cox. Then Richardson said, I can't fire Cox. Mr. Richard, we see you for a bit? I mean, can't possibly fire him. I'm going to resign first, so he resigns. There'll be an announcement out of the White House later on. I can't say a thing. There will be? Does it have to do with the resignation of the Attorney General? Then the order was given to the Deputy Attorney General, William Ruckelshaus, to fire Cox, the special prosecutor, and Ruckelshaus refused. You raise your right hand. I was Attorney General about 20 minutes. <laughs> I found out that 20 minutes is not long enough to get your picture on the wall. I really had no recourse uh, but to refuse to carry out the directive and to resign. To this day, Ruckelshaus doesn't know if he was fired first or resigned first. But in any case, he leaves the scene. And the third person in the list of succession is the Solicitor General, Robert Bork. It's Bork who finally does the deed and fires Cox. Well, by this time, the nation was up in arms. They, this was called the Saturday Night Massacre. We were horrified. This was not what we considered to be the role of the president or how democracy functions. So it looked like not only was Cox gone, but the investigation was over. So many Americans thought, oh my God, this is a coup d'etat. Basically, the president has seized full control uh, of the special prosecutor's office. They're impeding our operations right now. The White House, the executive branch, acted as if it was actually going to crush the entire investigation. Everyone, no one is about it. Our office had been seized, and to us, it was a clear attempt to obstruct the investigation, to interfere. And the American people were outraged and said, basically, you know, we're not a banana republic. We have a system of laws here. Even if it's the president of the United States, no one is above the law. And now the public opinion tide swung very strongly against Richard Nixon. Because that Saturday, known as the Saturday Night Massacre, did it. And who did it? Richard Nixon did it to himself. 
I have no intention whatever of walking away from the job I was elected to do. For the next year, so much of what went into the Watergate investigation was about what's on those tapes. The case goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rules unanimously that President Nixon must turn over subpoenaed material. When the case comes in eight to nothing against the president, the people who are still in the White House are afraid to tell the president. Somebody has the idea of putting a sign around the president's dog's neck, and all the sign will say is eight to nothing. Nixon loses, the tapes become public, and that's when the fun really starts. Nixon now! Nixon now! Those tapes portray a president who is intimately involved in a cover-up. The White House says an 18-minute segment of another of the subpoenaed Watergate tapes is missing. So here we have a tape that's clearly on a day when discussions by Nixon are going to be germane to this subject. And for 18 and a half minutes, it's been erased. Rosemary Woods is the loyal secretary to President Nixon. She was tasked with transcribing the tapes before they were turned over. Her explanation was that she was listening to the tape, and as she was listening, the telephone rang. She puts her foot down on a pedal wrongly, and for 18 and a half minutes, keeps it there. In the picture, you can see her holding on, white-knuckled. She's almost at a 45-degree angle to reach the phone. Well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it's preposterous. You think, why is there a reason that this Nixon loyalist is taking the fall for erasing what could be a very critical part of a conversation that is harmful to the president? And the reason is, it's harmful to the president. He knew that the tapes would incriminate him. And he didn't want the American people to know what was on the tapes. Now, on the investigation of the Democratic It showed that just about from the get-go, President Nixon was orchestrating the cover-up, telling his top staff to get the CIA to stop the FBI investigation. Now you had to reconsider everything Nixon has said publicly about the fact he didn't have a role in the cover-up. The so-called smoking gun tape proved from his own lips, from his own words, that he had orchestrated the cover-up of Watergate. This was the final blow, the final nail in the coffin, although you don't need another nail if you're already in the coffin, which we were. It was the public pressure that triggered the impeachment inquiry. And if that hadn't happened, who knows if there would have been an impeachment inquiry at all. Impeachment was not lightly thrown around. It had been a hundred years since the United States had ever impeached a president. Impeach Nixon now! Impeach Nixon now! The only institution that's left to provide some remedy is the Congress. Okay. It's my own judgment that this will require that they recommend the impeachment of the president. It is Watergate that forced the other branches of government and the American people to ask, is our president too powerful? The House Judiciary Committee got to the crux of the matter before it today, the case for impeachment of the president. I didn't want to have to vote for the impeachment. For the second time in the history of the Republic, a committee of the United States Congress is about to begin formally hearing evidence that may or may not lead to the impeachment of a president of the United States. I knew it was my responsibility that I'd taken oath of office to uphold the Constitution. I'll never forget the moment. It was the 27th of July, 1974. It was 7.05 in the evening when Peter Rodino, the chairman, said to his clerk, The record vote is demanded and the clerk will call the roll. All those in favor of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. All those opposed, no, and the clerk will call the roll. The, the mood in the room was very somber because it's an awesome thing to have to hold a president accountable and you don't do that lightly. Mr. Donahue, aye. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Mr. Kastenmeier. Aye. These are Democrats first, you see, down the line. Ms. Holtzman. Aye. I don't think anybody on that committee, Republican or Democrat, 
took any pleasure in that vote. Then it got to the Republicans. Mr. Hutchinson. No. Mr. McClory. No. Mr. Lott. No. The president was uh, was fighting it and uh, he would, did not intend to resign. I felt like that if he felt that strongly about it, then a lot of these accusations must not be true. Six Republicans said aye. Mr. Fish. Aye. Mr. Hogan. Aye. Mr. Butler. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Mr. Fraley. Aye. Mr. Railsback. Aye. We carried 27 to 11. The House Judiciary Committee votes to impeach President Nixon for obstruction of justice. And so the president faced the reality that he, he needed to go. It's time for him to go. What starts the clock ticking towards the resignation is the Supreme Court decision. When Richard Nixon loses U.S. v. Nixon, he thinks about resigning, his family pushes back. The tipping point was that a number of prominent Republicans came to Nixon and said, uh, we're not going to be able to support you in the Senate. Down to the White House trudged the senior Republicans on Capitol Hill. When Barry Goldwater and the leaders of the Republican Party in Congress come to him and say, look, it's just, it's over. Al Haig told me that, that the president's last great hope was George Wallace. The president said, George, are you still with me? And the governor said, no, I'm sorry, Mr. President, I am not. And uh, the president hung up, looked at me and said, Al, I just lost the presidency. President Nixon asked his daughter, Julie, to tell the First Lady that he's resigned. He doesn't tell the First Lady. You were the one who told him. Yes, I did. I said that Daddy felt that, that he had to resign. And the tears stood in her eyes, and I don't think she said anything. But she, she accepted it. She knew that it was the end. You had one last dinner, and uh, you asked the White House photographer to be there. I just had a feeling uh, that it was important that the event be recorded. They wanted a picture for history's sake. And we all linked arms and stood there and smiled. I put on a somewhat of a false front bravado and tried to arrange it in my usual way. You stand here, you stand here. It's interesting from how my mother looked at it. She hates that picture of all of us smiling because she said there our hearts were breaking and were smiling. I went down to the Lincoln Room and heard the chanting outside. Reminded me of the Vietnam days, except this time the chant was jail to the chief. Jail to the chief. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. Today at dawn, two men got up to go to bed tonight with very different titles and very different fates. I woke up with a start the last day, wondering if I'd overslept, and I looked at my watch. The battery had run out, worn out, at 4 o'clock the last day I was in office. By that time, I was worn out, too. Al Haig sort of knocked on the door. He brought one piece of paper. There was one line on it. He said, you know, we forgot to do this. Would you sign it now? I hereby resign the office of President of the United States. Mrs. Nixon and the President came down the elevator. I'll never forget, she said, uh, why are you doing this? The President has just entered with Mrs. Nixon to say goodbye to the White House staff and to his cabinet. You are here to uh, say goodbye to us. What we see in the East Room is the agony of being Richard Nixon. I, I don't think I could tell you without sobbing, so I'm not gonna try. I, I, I just get very emotional about it. He said, this isn't goodbye. The French have a word for it. We don't have a good word for it in English. Uh, the best is au revoir. We'll see you again. Every part of it was incredibly touching. The farewell speech to the staff, it was very difficult because he was really letting down his guard for one of the few times in public. He um, spoke from the heart. 
Patricia later in her diary wrote that for the first time she was glad people were able to see daddy as he really was. The greatness comes not when things go always good for you, but the greatness comes and you're really tested when you take some knocks, some disappointments. His voice cracking with emotion as he spoke about a man is not defeated until he gives up. You have to keep going in life, keep fighting. Only if you've been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. And he was saying goodbye to them. He was saying goodbye to a whole lot, to a political life. Always give your best. Others may hate you. But those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. Thank you very much. President and Mrs. Nixon, Vice President Gerald Ford, soon to be President, and Mrs. Ford walking the red carpet now. Mrs. Nixon had already got aboard ahead of me. I kind of raised my hand. I don't know whether it was a salute or a wave, but uh, that was it. When Nixon boarded the helicopter, I was glad to see him go. That meant the end of this turmoil and angst that we were all dealing with. As the helicopter began to rise, I heard Mrs. Nixon speaking to no one in particular, but to everyone. And she said, it's so sad. It's so sad. He, he looked at me and he said, my God, there's no going back. Yes or no? Are you sorry you didn't burn the tapes? People who worked for you, people who were close to you in one way or another, they say that you are cold, remote, and that they were unable to reach you. Why don't we get serious? Well, because I think people are still, I am serious. People are interested in you. People are still serious. trying to understand you. you I'm sorry you find it, you, that you find uh, these questions unserious. Uh, <laughs> we have a different idea, perhaps, of what serious is, but let me oh, go no, on. no, I'm not objecting to the questions, you know. Were there times when you, when you thought you might go under emotionally? Emotionally? Never. It's just part of my makeup. In just a few seconds we have left now, and there's almost just time for yes or no. Are you sorry you didn't burn the tapes? The answer is, I probably should have. But mainly, I shouldn't have even installed them because Johnson, our system was there, I had it taken out, and I shouldn't have ever put them in the but first place. But if you place. had it to do all over again, you'd burn them? Yes, I think so, because they were private conversations subject to misinterpretation, as we have all seen. Although Richard Nixon was never indicted, the evidence on the tapes and in the documents make it clear that there was a criminal in the White House. Nixon never acknowledged his guilt. Nixon could have survived if he apologized, but his approach was always total denial. He believed, and I think to the day he died, that what he did was best for the country. But the essence of every great leader I have known, he was a lonely man. Do you consider that you've had a good life? I don't get into that kind of crap. Richard Nixon was our most complicated president, capable of brilliant moments. He was also captive of a dark soul. When the president has no morals and is willing to lie, those are dangers for society. We can't allow the president not to regard facts as essential. And as John Adams told us, facts are stubborn things. You may pretend they're not there. You may try to explain them away. But a fact is a fact. This crisis basically was spawned and grew out of one man, Richard Nixon. 
So grip was he by hatred and anger at perceived enemies, that he lost his way. And the dark side of his personality came to dominate his actions as president. The story of Nixon's a story of perseverance, of resilience. Nixon summed this up when he said, a man is not finished when he's defeated. He's only finished when he quits. Nixon was no quitter. Maybe it's the description of my philosophy generally, it was of a little couplet that I received from Claire Booth Luce, and it read, I am hurt, but I am not slain. I shall lay me down and bleed a while, and I shall rise and fight again. That's the story of my life. <laughs>